Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, good. Thank you all for coming. I do talk very quickly. If you don't follow something, stop me and ask me to go over it again. Uh, it's an old educational theory that the more you pack into a lecture, the more people learn. The slower you go, the quicker they go to sleep, and the less they learn. So here I go. Introducing STEAM, what I love about S-T-E-A-M and STEAM itself, of course, is that it's an anagram for mates, because it's often mates cooperating and in rivalry, which drives along innovation, and they work often in teams, and teamwork is good. So we've got a, a little cluster of very helpful anagrams that I'm going to be playing on as we go through the STEAM of STEAM. Uh, there it is, there's the steam rising up. So, knowledge about steam being able to do stuff goes back a long way. The first mentions are 3rd century BCE, and in the 1st century CE, that's people of my age used once to call that AD, but we've become woke and we call it CE nowadays, uh, was hero of Alexandria's Aeliopile, and this was a, it was a toy. He worked out that if you boiled steam in a kettle, drove the steam up two arms, which acted as the pivots for a ball, which filled with steam, which had jets coming out of it, off would go the error pile. And this is my favorite place for a garden party. Here is the error pile, and yet it's not working. That was working when I tried it earlier, but it's not whizzing about. Let's try that again. Try, no, that is meant to whiz about. I'm sorry about that. This is one of those things, technical glitches. That may mean that quite a few of these animations don't work. It's the transfer between computers. Um, I could get my, I could stop momentarily, get my computer out and try and link it up, but that's not working. Let's try on. Okay, so the other thing that I'm going to be talking about, in the end, if you don't have words for stuff, it means you're not doing it. As we invent new things to do, we invent words to help us explain to ourselves what it is we think we're doing. This is one of my favorite toys. It's uh, something you can find on Google. It's called Ngram. And Ngram takes the uh, corpus of literature now in about 40 languages, although its Chinese corpus is particularly terrible. Uh, this is English, English. And it tracks the, the use of words through time. And here we're looking at artist, engineer, scientist, technologist, and mathematician. You'll see the last two, technologist and mathematician, hardly appear. But we do have this interesting rise in engineer, the green one. And it tracks quite nicely the rise of the use of steam to power industry, ships, railway engines, and so forth. So as you can see, as engineer takes off around about 1700, 1760, it begins to take off as a word. And as steam itself really builds during the 19th century, so the use of engineer builds too. Now, the, the full story is very complicated. This is just a, a very small snippet over about 60 years. Uh, with a little sub-snippet over about 50 years showing that we could all go very fast to sleep if I go in detail. So what I'm going to be de dealing with much more is a set of snapshots like a photo album in the hope that through time you get a sense of why steam mattered and it's more of a sociological history than it is a plod down the timeline. And a, a core idea is this little invented map of what I call Idesiania, which is a mythical country where people with specialties live in the outlying islands and they come into the central ferry piers uh, to meet. And you can see there's Truth Island with its lead town of Scientia, roughly where Mui War is, Usefulness Island with Pragmaticville as its main town, Efficiency Island with Output City. Beauty Island, Calonia, that's a Greek root meaning pretty. Uh, Proof Island for the mathematicians with, with Axiom City, which is, of course, Lama. And 
they all come into the central ferry piers at Innovationopolis, which gives us Growth Island. So this coming together of the five strands of understanding is the key. Specialization, uh, the belief in subjects is a conceit of educational bureaucrats. Anybody who's done real scholarship knows that you go wherever answering the question takes you. I borrowed here this lovely painting by Matisse. This is the first version of it. The second version is a bit darker. And it's called The Dance. What I like about it is all the dancers are female. And there they are, dancing in a circle. And they, to me, represent the five components which gave rise to the steam engine. And it's their, it's their dance as much as their dancing together which is what this is all about. As we'll see as we go on, lateral thinking, borrowing ideas, both across cultures and through time, is a key to the development of the steam engine. And as the dance goes on, the engines get smaller, they get more powerful, they use less fuel per horsepower per hour, they find more efficient propulsion systems which help them to do their work, and the, those systems are put inside more efficient ships and running from top left to bottom right you can see this enormous growth in horsepower that one in the top left which is Thomas Newcomen's at atmospheric engine of 1770 that vast thing as big as a two-story house was only two horsepower that's eight of us working each of us is capable of an output of about a quarter or quarter of a horsepower, so eight of us can do all the work of that huge atmospheric engine. By the time you get down to the middle of the 20th century, however, you've got that 37,500 horsepower steam turbine, so this massive increase in, in power. And what that did, I don't know why now, that's not meant to be there, so I'll, I can't take it away. Uh, what that did was create an enormous growth in sea trade in the course of 250 years. It's interesting that steam, which comes in right at the beginning here, only begins to kick the curve up off the bottom. This, it doesn't look terribly important, but that is the biggest revolution in, in human history that there has ever been. For the first time, economies were not cyclic. It wasn't a question of boom, starvation, bust, Boom, starvation, bust. For the first time, economies became able to continuously grow. And we'll come back to that later. And since, interestingly, steam disappeared and diesel took over, world trade has gone through the roof. This is an enormous change. But steam was very slow in, in taking over. Uh, technical re revolutions always are slow. Our default is actually to be against progress. We might not think so, but our default actually is to resist change. Change is very disruptive and people don't like it. And this change came about in the 17th, 18th century when people got curious about air and the absence of air. <gasps> Before the 17th century, nobody took much notice of air. They had strange and weird ideas. And Galileo, the great and wonderful Galileo, was worried about pumps. Somehow a pump never seemed to be able to raise water out of a hole in the ground higher than 10 metres. And he wasn't sure why. He came up with some ideas. And the solution was by one of his pupils called Torricelli. And Torricelli worked out that the atmosphere, this great lump of stuff above us, weighs something. And the huge column of the atmosphere. Hi, Crystal. Oh, sorry. Not hearing well? Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry. sorry. I mustn't look away from the microphone. Uh, the huge column of the atmosphere mm. weighs, and that weight has an effect. Now, Newcomen's engine actually uses this weight of the atmosphere, and its opposite, the absence of the atmosphere, which is a vacuum, just means emptiness. Vacuums are powerful. And those two ideas are what lie at the very beginning of 
the invention of the steam engine. It was called an atmospheric engine because actually it didn't use steam as steam. It used steam as something that became water. What happened was you had the big heavy beam up there, there, and that pulled a piston up in a cylinder, allowing steam, pretty much at atmospheric pressure, so steam like coming out of a kettle, to fill the piston. A little jet of water then shot into the piston and turned the steam back into water. And we'll come to what a powerful thing that is. The consequence of that was a vacuum in the piston, and so air pressing on the top of the piston shoved the piston down and pulled this beam down. It wasn't the pressure of steam, it was the creation of a vacuum. And the great genius of James Watt, the Scotsman, about 40, 50 years later, was to work out that steam could do the work, it could push the piston up, piston up. And that created all the problems because once you're going to use steam to do work, it must have pressure. And if it's going to have pressure, you've got to keep that pressure in. And that's where the engineers come in. That this took a long time is actually quite interesting because one of the results was for most of the Industrial Revolution, which we think of as powered by steam, steam didn't do a huge amount of work. What did the work was water. And again, there's a lovely thing you can still go see. Built in 1854, that's the interesting thing, when steam, most people think steam engines were driving industry. Here in 1854, the lazy Lady Isabella water wheel is built and it is driving the pumps. And that's true of much of the Industrial Revolution, that the work wasn't done by steam because steam really had a lot of technical de development. And for that technical development, it needed to, to find new ideas. But actually, what it nearly always did, back to this lateral thinking thing, was to borrow good ideas that had been around for a long time and put them to new use, often by creative thought. So everybody knew about water wheels. We've just seen the Lady Isabella. But what if, as opposed to the water pushing the wheel, the wheel pushed the water? Now that idea had been around certainly in Rome and in the Han Dynasty by the first decade CE uh, with paddle ships. This is a, a Song Dynasty drawing. Uh, I would love to see some bright science student build a trial replica. This has been done in uh, Europe where bright science students from Oxford built a replica war galley. Greek war galley called the Olympias because they wanted to see it. would it actually work? Did it do what it says all the history books say it does? So they built one to find out and actually it does. As far as I know nobody has built a Song Dynasty paddle boat and I would like to see if it worked because if each human being can only put out a quarter of a horsepower and all the little models you see of how these are supposed to work uh, were actually put into practice. Could a bunch of healthy students drive this paddle boat along very efficiently? This is what's called replica archaeology, and it's well worth doing. Not <laughs> sure. The other invention is the crank. You can see in this piece of Han Dynasty, dynasty uh, pottery uh, model, which were funerary models to put in, in, in funerals, in, in tombs, a guy's working a crank to work a winnowing fan which is like a paddle wheel, only it's a paddle wheel that blows air. These ideas, 1700 or so years later, get borrowed. This is one of the first ever steamboats by a chap called William Symington, a very inventive Scot, which is called the Lord Dundas. And you can see how he's using the paddle wheel, he's using the crank, and here's the motor with its plodding beam, nodding beam, which is doing the work. Now here, I was hoping to have another thing that will work. Will it? No. Sorry about this. Technical Lulu 
none of this translates across. That's a pity, because some of these videos were real fun. Uh, but there we go. Once James Watt had made his revolution, it's possible for, it was possible for the engines to get smaller. If you're working at higher pressures, you can have smaller cylinders. Once the engines get smaller, you can put them in things. And you can put them in boats and make the boats go along. And this is the first steamship to arrive in China. What I love about it is, that, apart from this being my first little example of art playing a role, and we'll come back to Sun Kwa in a minute, one of the most interesting things about this is the hybrid technology. You've got a, a Western steam vessel built, interestingly, in Kolkata in India. Uh, the East India Company was a pioneer in the use of steam. So here it is, a Western-style steam paddle vessel built in India, but its rig is Chinese. The Forbes had a junk rig on the three front masts. You can see the junk sails neatly folded down here. Uh, so here was a, an example of a new form of uh, mechanical efficiency, the steam engine, borrowing an older form of wind technology efficiency, the, the junk sail. So good technologists are always open to good ideas from anywhere. Ideas don't have nationalities. They don't speak languages. They're just good ideas or bad ideas. That early technology, interestingly, again, this business of our default being we don't like progress, has hung around. It was still that nodding beam engine, walking beam engine, as it was called, was still in use and could be seen in Victoria Harbour, just outside the window here, as late as the 1920s. And you can go visit a, sh uh, a ferry in San Francisco that was still working with the walking beam engine in 1957. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, the problem with the steam engine, once it started developing and you started to use pressure to make it work, is that you came up immediately against the limits of, let's call it pre-modern technology what people can do with their hands and the standard tools that our forefathers, four, four forefathers worked with. Because when you subject things to pressure and it's a gas, not a liquid, then you have problems with leakage. And if steam engines leak, then they're inefficient, they use too much fuel and that actually counters the whole object that you're aiming at. It's, that's just the inefficient clouds of steam. It is a problem because, as you can see, one cubic centimetre of water, when turned into steam, increases by nearly 200,000%. This is a massive increase in volume. If you've got a container and you take a small amount of water and, you, water and you turn that to steam, this steam is going to be pressing out against the limits of the container and it's going to test how well that container has been made. This bit of the story is about the triumph of precision and I'm going to tell it in a number of ways. One key figure is this chap, John Wilkinson. And this is another little element in technical development it's its close relationship with war. John Wilkinson was an iron master in Shropshire in Britain, and what he discovered was by using this machine down here, which is what's called a cannon boring lathe, that he could make more accurate cannon for the Royal Navy by instead of casting the cannon with something in the middle of the cannon so that when it had cooled down, you could take the central bit out, and you'd already got a hole which you could just ream out to make nice and smooth. But it was very inaccurate. You didn't always get the central plug right in the center. Uh, the stuff pouring down the sides of the barrel uh, was inhibited in getting rid of the impurities up to the top. So the walls of the barrel were, were often uh, irregular. And that had two consequences. The cannonball shot out of the barrel didn't necessarily go as far or in the right direction that you wanted. 
because it would wobble, rattle as it went down the barrel, and gas would get around the sides of the cannonball because of a bad fit, and the cannonball wouldn't get enough of a push. And because you had irregulars, ir irregularities in the casting, the cannon would burst, which is not good for the guys firing it. Wilkinson worked out if you cast the cannon solid and then drilled it out, then you would get much more accurate cannon, more accurate fire, more precise fire, everything that sailors wanted. But also, because all of these guys knew each other, back to mates and teams, Wilkinson knew James Watt and Matthew Bolton, who were the big steam engine guys. They got talking, and he said, well, you've got a problem with your pistons, because the way they made pistons was to wrap steel plate around and rivet it together. And it was never truly round and never truly gas tight. And Wilkinson said, well, what if I bored you out a cylinder from a solid chunk of iron? I could make it as good as a cannon. In fact, what he said is I can bore it out as true as the thickness of a shilling piece, which was about two millimeters, which in the late 18th century was incredibly tight tolerances. So Watt and Co said, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, and the result was much more efficient steam engines. So what this introduces is, is this business, and here comes art. You may have thought that steam engines didn't have much art in them. We'll see that steam engines have a lot of art. And in particular this one, it's the art of measuring and drawing precisely. We would never have had the steam revolution if people had not been able to draw and measure precisely. These two Ming armchairs are utterly beautiful. They are exquisitely made. I don't know if you've ever seen a Ming, ar Ming armchair dismantled. I was lucky enough to see one dismantled at the Chinese University's uh, Museum and Art Gallery some years back. And the jointing is just divine. I mean, to be able to do carpentry like that would be wonderful. But no chair is the same. When my partner and I had a boat made for us in Taiwan, the Taiwanese craftsmen made all the interior, interior furniture. And at the bottom of the ladder going down to the cabin, there was a grating, a rectangular grating, uh, which you could stand on to let drips go down into a tray below. And it was rectangular. So you thought, if you picked it up and rotated it and put it down, it would fit. But it didn't. It was made by eye, like these chairs, and so it wasn't precise. The great revolution of steam was a revolution in precision. Here's what precision means. If we start in the bottom right there, you can see somebody who is pretty typical of the pre-industrial world. It touches where it fits, as my grandmother used to say, of my sister's sewing. Uh, it touches where it fits. It's, it's as accurate and as precise as people will put up with. It doesn't have to be terribly good, it's good enough. The alternative here is that it's just hopeless. It, it's neither accurate nor precise. Up here, you've got something that is extremely precise, but it's not very accurate. But if you're a devoted rifle shot, as I was in my youth, this is the dream, to be both precise and accurate. And the technical revolution of the steam engine is about being both precise and accurate. And that depended on something quite revolutionary, which was systems of precision measurement. Now, anybody who's read G.R.G. G. Worcester about Chinese junks and sampans, he has a wonderful little, little vignette early on in his third book, uh, The Junkman Smiles, well, he points out, he worked for the Chinese Maritime Customs, and he points out that in the 1930s, the standard Chinese unit of measurement, the, uh, the roughly the foot, uh, there were 138 different, in China, in the 1930s. 
depending on whether you were a carpenter or a mason or made silk, whether you lived in Zhejiang or Guangdong, whether you lived in Guangzhou or Zhaojing, all of these different places varied because people can use measurement to make money by excluding people. This is what the World Trade Organization is about. It's about making sure we can't decide if it, somebody's going to import a car to us, it must have tires which only we make by specifying this particular measurement. But in order to, to set up international standards, you've got to have some means of ensuring that you can measure whatever detail it is. And when you want to be precise, that you can measure precisely right down to very small measurements. There's some silly stuff down the bottom there of how incredibly small, quite literally unimaginably small, we can now measure the wavelength of a proton, which is about uh, only half as great, again, I think, as the smallest possible measurement, which is what's called Planck distance, but no matter. This begins in the 17th century with a wonderful chap called William Gascoigne, who develops the first micrometer screw gauge. And he reckoned he could measure to about three one thousandths of an inch. Uh, I don't, not, none of these are left. But this one is, this is the next development about a hundred years later, again by James Watt. Without James Watt, goodness knows what would have happened. And he builds this beautiful little micrometer screw gauge where he's able to measure this is, notice, in 1772, he's able to measure to one ten-thousandth of an inch. You can't see a ten-thousandth of an inch, half. Along with this go the development of these tight measurements. Here's Jesse Ramsden, another great figure from this late 18th century, who develops a machine for cutting precise screw threads. And this amazing dis dividing engine, as he called it, which is a machine for making exact scales. So you can make a ruler that always is exactly the same as every other ruler in its measurement of the distances along the ruler. Or an arc that always measures the same, exactly the same angle and fraction of an angle. Without these sorts of development, the further development of steam could not have happened. Little aside here, and it's something I'll pick up on later, what was emerging in the 18th century is an understanding of and a belief in the importance of the freedom of ideas. And this is a wonderful example. Many of the people who drove this precision instrument making in Britain were refugees from France and the intolerance of the French authorities for anybody who was not a Roman Catholic. As a result of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, these people, called Huguenots, were driven out of France in the late 17th century. And they formed the nucleus of the great technical instrument makers of the 18th century in London. So intolerance of people's religious beliefs drove those people to somewhere else, where their technical brilliance gave the British Industrial Revolution its kickstart. The encyclopedia is full of this technical stuff. These are, are drawings of a galley and a warship um, to scale. And you can take the data that's there and turn it into the real thing. This becomes, therefore, the engineering drawing. This is James Watt, again, who makes these precise drawings of the bits of his engine. Why? Because for the first time, what he's building is not put together in his workshop and sold from the workshop, like a watch or a clock, to a client. Instead, he's making parts in his workshop, taking the parts to the site, and getting the guys there to fit it together. So they need a diagram to show them how to put it together, and it needs to be exact. Today, iPhones assembled in Shenzhen are made in 43 different countries and assembled there. It's the same basic idea. And here is where it begins. Another element of this takes us truly into the heart of art. An Arab called, in Western terms, 
Al-Hazem, uh, I can't really pronounce his name in Arabic, but it, and it's jolly long, and there it is, Abu Ali al-Hassan, Ibn al-Hassan, Ibn al-Haytam, who lived in Cairo. He wrote a brilliant extension of the Greek thinker Aristotle called The Optics, the Book of Optics. It was translated into Latin in the end of the 12th century, and it fired up a development in Renaissance Europe of perspective drawing. The idea that you can create a three-dimensional effect on a two-dimensional surface. This perspective drawing is an incredibly important part of the development of engineering. And the fellow in the pick, Gaspard Monge, in 1765, as it were, reverse-engineered a perspective drawing and said, we can break a perspective drawing down into three orthogonal views which can have exact measurements. The elevation when you look at it from the side, the plan where you look at it from on top or below, and the cross section where you slice it and take the exact measurements. And with precise drawings like that, like Monge, engineering drawings, technical drawings as we call them now, you can start creating exact replicas of the same thing. So you can have serial production of a steam engine. Virtually all steam engines, really before about 1780, were unique. I'll build you this engine. After 1780s, 1790s, you start getting serial production. I will order one of Mr. Watt's six horsepower engines. And Mr. Watt's six horsepower engine, rather like later, Mr. Ford's Model T car, came as a package. And you would link it up like you wished. So we've got to the point where we've got an engine and it's called, in the jargon of the trade, a prime mover. The steam engine is the prime mover. It's what provides the oomph. It goes through a linkage, don't need to wait, the walking beam is a linkage, to a propulsion device. Now this package, the prime mover, the linkage, the propulsion device, must develop integrity. All the bits have got to keep developing, or you won't get an efficient steam engine. And so what we see is this development. There's the mobile phone. I can remember taking one of those bricks to see in a yacht on the first Aberdeen Boat, boat Club's Four Peaks race, uh, second, in 1986. We, we carried one of these bricks with us to experiment for Hutchison Telecom. It was an enormous, it was actually quite useful because our mast fell down. But uh, it, it's gone from that to this in uh, not much more than about 30, 30 or so years. It took steam engines, uh, st steam engines ship in ships a bit longer from Jonathan Hulls, he was, he was a priest who developed this steam tug. It's, it was probably never built. Nobody's quite certain. Through the American Robert Fulton's Claremont, all the way down through this massive liner that burned and sank in Hong Kong Harbour, and uh, through further developments to what will probably replace it. Uh, this was launched this year, the Yara Birkeland, which is intended to be the world's first autonomous electric ship. Doesn't have people on it at all, uh, which is pretty amazing. So let's look at this first propulsion device, the paddle wheel. Now the paddle wheel is a very clever idea, but it's not like a wheel wheel. This is a wheel wheel, and as a wheel revolves one revolution, it moves its circumference along the road or the rail. The trouble with the paddle wheel is it suffers from slip, and You've also got one each side of the ship. So as the ship rolls in a rough sea, one paddle's coming out of the water, one paddle's going in. So it's not tremendously efficient. Now there was another really great. This is not going to work, unfortunately. No, nope, it's not. This young, uh, I think he's an Australian Chinese lad, who has developed this high-speed paddle boat. He's taken an old uh, catamaran and put this really fast whirling paddle wheel on the back of it, driven by a little petrol engine, and it roars around at about 20 miles an hour. I mean, incredibly fast. But when you look at it, you realize that for 
every revolution of the paddle wheel, the boat is actually only moving along about a tenth of the circumference of the paddle wheel. There's huge amounts of loss. So it's a great idea, but it's not very efficient. So the big effort was to try and see if there could be a better way of doing it. Something that didn't act on the surface, but act, uh, acted under the surface. And again, lateral thinking. People have got some ideas. We, we literally don't know where they got the ideas from. Uh, one bright idea was to use a screw. And interestingly, the guy who had the idea of using a screw was the guy who invented the propeller for the fir world's first ever submarine, Bushnell's Turtle. And he was actually a clockmaker with the wonderful name of Isaac Doolittle. And Isaac Doolittle's propeller was the first one we know of, the 17, 1770s. But unfortunately, it was used in the American War of Independence. And the British sank it, and it was lost, lost forever. And as a result, the screw didn't take off. A possible other contribution came from the Jujing Ding, which you can buy, I saw you can buy one in, in uh, Yongshou Wan on the main street, just by whizzing your hand like that. It goes off like a helicopter. Um, nobody knows. Both of those are possible inspirations. And I had someone working one here, but that's not going to work either. And so in the first half of the 18th, 19th century, you see people coming up with attempts to work out the best way to drive a ship along using a screw. You've got Francis Pettit Smith with his first propeller patent, that's the first one we've got recorded, in 1835, which is quite literally an Archimedean screw, which is not efficient. The Swedish-American John Ericsson files a patent in 1838. There's this double screw. He later refined it and turned it into a single screw. And you can actually go and see that because it drove the American Civil War ship Monitor. And in the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, they've got the remnants of the, mo of the Monitor, including its propeller. So you can see an Ericsson original propeller. But the final design was this one by Robert Griffiths, uh, a Welshman, who came up with what has, is now, and has since been, the standard pattern for propeller. He didn't really know why. He kept trying until he came up with this design, and it took the genius of Rankin, Greenhill, and Froud uh, over a 25-year period to work out the maths of why a propeller worked. And the result is that. There's the world's biggest at the moment. Came from the Maersk Triple E. It weighs 130 tons. It's 9.45 meters in diameter. And it is simply vast. And if you look really carefully, you can see that there are clear family resemblances to Robert Griffith's ideas in 1849. To prove definitively that the propeller was superior to the paddle wheel, somebody came up with the most perfect experiment. Gossip says that there was a certain amount of uh, underhand play in this experiment. So its results are not quite as trustworthy as it, it looks like they are. But this famous painting shows the screw sloop. These were identical vessels, nearly identical. The screw sloop rattler towing the paddle sloop electo backwards in a series of trials that have always happened. The rattler could tow the Electo, though both had steam engines of identical power. And the Rattler, of course, actually has a Hong Kong connection. It served in Hong Kong from 1855 to 1856. And if you go to the Hong Kong Cemetery, uh, you can see the Gaolan Memorial, which is a memorial to some sailors who died from the Rattler combating pirates in an island just south and west of Macau. So we've got improved propulsion systems. The next thing is we got better engines, improved propulsion systems. Can we actually make the ships into which all of this is going better too? All the first steamships were built out of wood. The trouble is the steam engines were pretty big and very heavy, and the stresses on a wooden hull, which is all bolted together, proved to, reduce, to shorten the life of the hulls. By and large, wooden boats don't like steam engines. So 
The first experimental steamship, the Aaron Manby, was built in Shropshire in bits and carried to London in bits where it was assembled. It was then sailed to Paris and it stayed in service in Paris and on the Loire at Nantes for the next 30 years, plying back to showing that iron ships work. By the 1840s, the belief in them being able to work meant that the, uh, the killer app that the British brought to China in 1841 was the iron warship Nemesis, which was, in effect, the, uh, the secret weapon that defeated uh, even the best efforts of the Chinese forces to keep the British at bay. We can cut that one short by saying ultimately what this was, along with science, with, with the technology of the engine and the propulsion system, was the invention of naval architecture. Before naval architecture was invented in the mid-19th century, it was called naval science. Uh, and naval architecture emerges as, as a term in John Fincham's book in 1820-something, having first been studied as naval science by the French, Pierre Bouguet, and then come on my heroes, which are Brunel, John Scott Russell, and the Froude father and son, who really created the modern naval architectural world we still use today. You talk to any naval architect, he'll talk to you about Froude numbers. Froude numbers are the key to designing an efficient ship's hull. Finally, you needed to be able to make the engines ever more efficient by increasing the pressure at which the steam operated. Now, this was really difficult because gases under high pressure are extremely dangerous. The key understanding began with these two guys in the 17th century, the Englishman Robert Boyle and the French physicist Edmond Mariotte, and they discovered a law which, if we're being fair, we call the Boyle-Mariotte law, which says that the constant temperature, the volume and the pressure of a given mass of a gas are inversely proportional. Now, this is not going to work again. Oh, it is. Ha! Ah, this one does work. So here we've got uh, Boyle's law, boyle mariotte law, shown at work how, as you increase the pressure, the volume decreases in proportion. As you decrease the pressure, the volume increases in proportion. The mass being kept constant and the temperature being kept constant. Mariotte's contribution was to point out that the temperature mattered because the hotter the gas, the more volume it occupied. So there, there was a variation. This required a revolution in boiler design. I'm, I'm co collapsing an awfully lot, an awful lot into awful little here. You start off with something exactly like your domestic kettle. It's actually called a kettle boiler. And the kettle boiler on the top left just boils steam in a vessel and it gathers in the top of the vessel and goes out through a pipe like it goes out through the spout of your kettle. If you look up Wikipedia, steam boiler, you'll find 129 different boiler types. Boiler design was suck it and see. Lots and lots of people with creative ideas testing always the limits of the technology, we'll come to that in a minute, in order to get to the point where you could have boilers like the one at the bottom right, which is where I did my naval engineering training on three drum, an admiralty three-drum boiler like this, um, which operates at quite enormous pressures and temperatures. When a steam line breaks in an engine room, what comes out of the steam line is invisible. It's at incredibly high temperature, and if it's a very small gut, a very small jet of it, it will cut your arm off like a laser knife uh, before, that is, it boils you. The trouble is it does require pretty good engineering. Back to precision, back to good, good materials. And early boilers aiming for better pressures had a terrible record of going bad. And these, the, these are taken from contemporary press in the 1860s through 1890s, pretty much Every year, there'd be two or three boiler explosions in ships, which usually cost a lot of lives, uh, 
They weren't all bad maintenance. It was usually simply somebody trying to operate something at too high a pressure for the materials and the design. In the end, everybody settled on the boiler on the right. The early ideas was you took, a bit like a kettle, you took uh, hot air and you passed it through, sorry, this one here, you took hot air and you passed it across water. Um, in the end, this, sorry, this is the first one, this is the fire tube. You pa passed hot tubes of air through a container of water. This actually is very slow to heat the water up. It's not very flexible. And so as the engineering improved, and you could take higher pressures, what you did is you put the hot air around tubes of water. Now, there's a lot of complexity in that because the water becomes a big issue. Where is the water going to come from? All the early boilers used seawater because water on a ship needs, is needed for people. We can't last very long without water. And the seawater was everywhere. And when you boil seawater, the steam that comes off is exactly the same as the steam that comes off when you boil fresh water. The trouble is, where does the salt go? And the salt tended to deposit itself on the sides of the tubes or the plates or whatever it was in the boiler. They would narrow the passage of the steam that increased the pressure in the boiler back. So one of the big efforts was to try to create an independent supply of water. And that became the basis of what's called a Rankin cycle, where you start off with some feed water. It goes through the engine, comes out the other side, goes into what's called a condenser, is turned back into water, and is put back into the engine. If you've got no leaks in your pipe, you've got a perfect closed loop cycle that ensures that the engine is feeding it. And we'll look at an example of where that goes. Another big effort was fuel. How can we get the most efficient fuel? So geologists, chemists, are there working hard to try and work out what makes an efficient fuel. And ultimately, it's what's called there. It's heat content. The lowest heat content is wood. The best heat content is oil. And this ultimately has to do with how, efficient your in how efficiently your engine turns the fuel into effort at the other end. There are limits. This is where science came in. In the early 19th century, a Frenchman called Sadi Carnot comes up with the perfect theory of the heat engine, which says it doesn't matter how good your fuel is, doesn't matter how excellent your engineering design, there's a limit. It can only be 63% efficient. You can never have a 100% efficient engine. And that goes into a whole other area of science, which I'm not talking about very long, except just to mention that women do not feature large in this story. But there is one great woman from the 18th century called Emily du Châtelet, who's one of the great mathematicians of the 18th century. And she's the first person to come up with the theory of entropy, which is the tendency of all systems. And it's why steam engines can never be 100% efficient. If they could be, we'd have perpetual motion, and you can't have that. Women do feature here, though. Uh, putting the fuel on board the ships, called coaling ship, was an international exercise. Hong Kong had about 90,000 tonnes of coal in big heaps all the way around the harbour, right the way through until the 1930s. Even when I came back to Hong Kong to teach at Hong Kong U in 1974, even then, the Marine Department kept a reserve of 3,000 tonnes of coal in order to, to provide fuel for the very few coal-burning ships that were still around, relics of the Second World War. Coaling ship, you didn't find Western sailors doing the coaling themselves if they could avoid it. And the famous crews in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Nagasaki in Japan nearly always included both men and women. You can see the, the women here, they've got skirts, the chaps have got trousers. Uh, likewise here, the women have got the long white headdress. Uh, the men have got bare heads or caps. The other thing was, 
in this development of more efficient engines, if you just use steam once and then you turn it back into water, you've never managed to use very much of the steam's power. Compounding became an idea that people tried to do. And this actually is quite interesting because compounding, using steam more than once, so you start with a high pressure steam cylinder and when that exhausts, you take the steam that comes out and you push it into a lower pressure and you, when that exhausts, you take the steam that comes out and you put it into a lower pressure, still always bigger because as the steam is getting uh, at lower pressures, so it takes up more volume. The most it ever got to was quadruple expansion. This was the workhorse of the steam engine. And it was late arriving. The triple expansion engine doesn't really arrive until the 1880s. And it was late arriving for two reasons. One, back to this default, we don't like change. But two, the patent system. The compound steam engine was actually invented by one of James Watt's apprentices and co later co-workers in the 1780s. And Watt's patent prevented him from using his knowledge to create a compound engine. And by the time it looked like a good idea, it was too late. And so the, engine, the, 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 the idea went dormant for about 30 years until it made a reappearance. Until an even better idea came along by a man called Charles Parsons. Parsons was trying to create a steam engine that would make electricity. Now the key to making electricity is a dynamo. And a dynamo is a number of coils of copper wire that whiz around very fast inside some permanent magnets. And that makes electricity. The trouble with steam engines, pistons that go up and down, is you've got to turn reciprocal motion into rotary motion with inefficiencies as a result of lost motion. Parsons thought, if I can develop a turbine that whizzes round, then I've got rotary motion going directly to rotary motion, and I can make electricity. Unfortunately, turbines are very difficult to design, and Parsons' first turbines didn't work well enough, so he, it looked like he was going to go bankrupt. So he thought, well, it may not work well enough to make electricity, but maybe it will work well enough to drive a boat. And maybe that would go very quickly. So he built this boat called Turbinia, uh, which you see roaring along here. And just to prove his point, he, at the fleet review in 1897 for Queen Victoria's Jubilee, he took this boat and he raced up and down inside all the ships causing consternation because the Royal Navy did not have any vessels fast enough to catch it. The Royal Navy having resisted turbines of any kind at that point and still managed to resist them for quite a while afterwards before finally deciding that turbines were a good idea. It gets into the commercial world quite literally five or six years later with this ferry, uh, the Prince Edward in the waters off Glasgow and it's out in the Far East here very quickly the Japanese by this time are industrializing extremely fast and they build their first turbine vessel, the Tenyo Maru, in 1908 and it visited Hong Kong in that year, in June. So Hong Kong saw turbines pretty soon after they'd been first invented. Back to efficiency, uh, you can see that ultimately steam turbines are more efficient than reciprocating engines. They're so efficient indeed that 89% of the electricity, everything that's going on in here with the lights, the power point, uh, what charged my batteries from my mobile phone, all of this is being created by a steam turbine as I speak. Steam power is vitally important to all of our lives every day. Those of us who live on Lama are living with four whopping steam turbines just over the hill from Yung Shui Wan. So a turbine was much more efficient, but you'll notice it really wasn't the early turbines. They weren't that efficient. A triple expansion engine was only 11% efficient. If you go back to Newcomen's engine, it was probably only about 1% or 2% efficient. So there's this growth of efficiency. And these days, with nuclear submarines and power stations, they're getting up 
close, quite close, to the Carnot limiting efficiency of 63%. Now, that was another thing that's not going to show. So the ultimate for steam is this. It's a nuclear reactor. First one goes to sea in the submarine down the bottom there. In 1954, the USS Nautilus was a program pushed forward by an American naval engineer called Hyman Rickover, a great man in the story of steam. And what he was doing, again, there's this recursiveness, there's this tendency to build on past knowledge, is he's picking up on the ideas of this really strange guy called William Rankin, who spent his entire academic career, as academics tend to, sniping and bitching at a bloke who was cleverer even than he was, which was William Thompson, Lord Kelvin. Uh, and as a result, few people have heard about, lots of people have heard of Kelvin's work, and Kelvin has given us our major temperature scale from zero to the top of the, of the scale. It's minus 273 centigrade. But Rankin comes up with this idea of the closed loop system, a Rankin cycle, where the feed water is enclosed within the system. That's the cooling and heating system. So you get virtually no efficiency loss. And a nuclear reactor is a perfect example of a Rankin cycle. It's why nuclear power stations are actually a great idea if we can work out how to take in the bits afterwards. And Hong Kong features in the story. Because although nuclear power in ships is almost exclusively nuclear power in warships, this was one of the world's three nuclear-powered merchant ships, all of which were experimental, and the Savannah, a very, very beautiful ship, which was built in 1962, came to Hong Kong four times in the course of her brief career. And you can see the picture there of her anchored off stone cutters, another one of her off Ching Yi, uh, and a newspaper story from the Post. Every time she came, there was, a, there was a newspaper story about this nuclear steamship. Can you imagine today a nuclear-powered vessel anchoring uh, quite close to downtown Hong Kong? Mm, maybe not. We don't like change. So art, art mattered, and matters hugely. If artists take a negative view of technical change, technical change can often get halted in its tracks. Indeed, technical change may never even begin. Are artists interested in and skilled at technical drawing? Does their work help technical development? Do they depict steamships accurately? Is the image they convey positive or negative? And if you can, what I'm going to do now is contrast 19th century China and the West, which is interesting in the case of steam engines, and what the answers are. Here's the first technical drawing of a steam engine that we find in China. Uh, Ding Gong Chen was probably the first guy in China really to understand how steam engines work. He was in Guangzhou. And he visited a lot of Western steamships and he kind of got it. He, he understood for the first time. There's some hilarious narratives from Lin Shu describing steam engines and they just, they cannot work out what the hell is going on. Uh, Lin Shu thinks it's smoke. Smoke's what's doing the stuff. Uh, Qi Ying says, no, nah, it's, it's flames. Flames are doing it. Ding Gong Cheng gets it, and he tries to get an artist to draw what he wants to describe. And if you look carefully at this, it simply doesn't do it. Almost all the important bits are missing. The things that show you how the steam gets in and out, uh, how the steam is controlled, the input, the exhaust, what makes the piston go up and down and round and round. All of this is missing. And until Chinese artists had learned to draw steam engines, to do technical drawing, which is not part of China's tradition, once they'd learned to do technical drawing, then away it all goes. But they had to learn this way of seeing first. Now, here's a contrasting example. Now, this fascinates me. At the bottom, we've got Tinghua and Sunghua. Both artists in what's called China Export or China Trade Art working out of Guangzhou. And they're 
painting stuff for Western clients. And when they paint steamships, they paint steamships really well. Doesn't mean to say they know how it works, but they do represent the steamship like the steamship looks. I mean, maybe they're flattering a bit, but they broadly get it right. By contrast, you've got that picture above of a contemporary of Tinghua and Sunghua, who does the nemesis. It's ridiculous. It's a, in effect, it's a caricature. It's not that he can't. Clearly, he could have done. But he didn't. Why didn't he? Because steam was not perceived positively. It was othered. It was their stuff. It was to be seen as weird, different, dangerous. Caricature it. Persuade people it's not worth paying any attention to. By contrast in the West, you've got artists who are basically okay with steam. Not just the ones who are doing the technical drawing, but the people who are selling it. Here you've got artists who are doing fantastic posters encouraging people to catch steamships across the Pacific. You've got artists who are selling books. This is the nemesis, quite different to uh, that nemesis, which the nemesis has only got one funnel, uh, not two. So artists here are giving a positive spin to art. Now, this takes me to what, to me, is the most telling. Because these are, when we get to the, those were working artists, graphic artists, we call them, jobbing artists. This is one of the greatest artists in the book. And this is GMW Turner's 1839 painting of the Fighting Temeraire, one of the ships that fought at Trafalgar, oh, great moment in British naval history, being towed to her last berth. But now you've been hearing about steam, so you can look at this painting quite differently. This is not about the Temeraire. It's about the death of sail and the arrival of steam. There's a steam tug towing the glory of the past to its death. The tide is ebbing. You can see that here. If you look, this, the boy is called, this boy is called watching. The boy is watching and you can see the sea streaming past it going that way. So we know Turner is telling us the tide's going out and it's carrying out with us, with it, these sailing ships, which are unable to move without wind. And there's no wind, it's a flat sea. So they drift out on the tide and the one sailing ship that's trying to come in, you can just see it there, can only come in because, by golly, there's a steam tug towing it in. So Turner is saying to us, yeah, it may not be pretty, but it's the future. And since he's also a visionary of, as, as an artist, when he gets to show us where art is going, he uses steam. Steamboat of a harbour's mouth. This utterly mind-boggling painting. The heart of it is a steamship. So art is playing a subtle but incredibly important role in advancing our idea. The scientists, the technologists, the engineers, the mathematicians, they know what's going on. We don't necessarily know what's going on unless somebody is helping us see. And that is the role of art. So clouds of steam. For China, that meant a revolution in ways of seeing. The old six Confucian arts, which had been, had been at the heart of Chinese literati education since forever, had to go. They had to cede ground to science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. And how was it going to do that? The old Wuxing, the five elements, 
they actually said steam engines cannot work. Because if you look at the Wuxing, fire is directly opposed to water. Fire suppresses water, and water destroys fire. So how can fire and water work together to create something that drives a ship? This comes, you can actually see this working in Chinese vocabulary. This, unfortunately, Google have recently completely changed their n-gram analysis of the Chinese language. They used to have a very neat deal whereby they turned modern uh, simplified characters into the traditional character and searched older literature for the traditional character. They've just junked that, so now you don't get any results from Google n-gram in Chinese until after 1900. But here you can see it's, it's clanky, it's a bit jerky, but what they had to do was combine the steam we cook rice and vegetables with, which is kind of wet and passive and doesn't do stuff, with a new idea, a very old idea, which is qi, the animating force. And by putting those two together, they get a new concept, which is a powerful steam, a steam that's got oomph. And you can see, as steam arrives in China and begins to become part of the modern world with steam engines and steam ships and steam power in factories. So the use of this new concept helps to power the steam revolution in China. And these are the two guys, the two heroes of steam in China, Xu Shou and, and Hua Hengfan. They, amazing old guys, they get told by Song Guofang the, the, mark, the viceroy of the Liangjiang, build a steamboat. You know, they, these guys, they, they've been kind of interested in this Western stuff. But this very powerful guy says, build a steamboat. They go, build a steamboat. Okay, sir. Off they go. It takes them four years. And the help of some engineers who've been working for the arsenal in, in, in Hangzhou, who had brought some modern machine tools from the, the, the British ships that had been brought out for the Chinese Navy, what was called the Osborne, Lay Osborne Flotilla, which had to be sent back to Britain because of big uh, fallouts in personalities. But with all of this help, they eventually built a little eight meter long paddle steamer, the Huanghu, the Yellow Swan. Sadly, not a single picture of this exists. Nobody, back to the art, nobody thought to draw it. Nobody thought, and at this point, 1865, there were even photographers around, nobody took a photograph. We just have the written record of this huge mountain that these two guys climbed. And they had to be scientists, technologists, engineers, artists, and mathematicians in one. They had to be able to do it all. And the triumph of both of them is that that's what they did. And then they went on to found some of the first modern schools in China, which were responsible for so much of the modernization that took place at the end of the 19th century. So I'm going to try your patience just a little bit longer by talking about something that I realized that I'd left out when I first wrote this all for what would have been the school science fest this spring, but which COVID-19 derailed. And I realized I talked about STEAM because that's what people talk about. They talk about science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. But that's typical of any closed-minded bureaucratic government approach to learning, because there's another S that needs to go on the end. Steams. And that other S is this guy, Adam Smith, and his revolutionary book, The Wealth of Nations. Because at the end of the 18th century, what today we call the social sciences began to emerge as part of this absolute change in the way we see the world. And these guys, that's another thing that's not going to work, 
what I, this was a little, and maybe it will, let's try it, let's, let's be an optimist. Now, this is Newton's wheel, where you take the primary colours of S-T-E-A-M, you whiz them, and they go white, and become the last S of the six components of steams. Because what the 18th century discovered, as they discovered engineering and steam, was that rights to private property, if James Watt had not been able to patent his steam engine, Matthew Bolton would never have put the money in, and they wouldn't have made money, they couldn't have repaired their errors, they couldn't have developed their steam engine, it had its defects, but they had to have their right to their private property. The markets they operated in had to be free, if regulated. They had to have fair, transparent and consistently applied laws to enforce these things. And critically, back to those Huguenots who arrived to make the instrumentation, there had to be freedoms of the individual, of meeting, of thought, of speech and of communication. There's a wonderful book by a lady called Jenny Uglo, a British historian, called L The Lunar Men. And there was a society in the late 18th century in the, where James Watt and Matthew Bolton lived, and they were both members. It was called the Lunar Society. They met on the night of the full moon every month, because then they could ride home after the meeting without street lights, because there weren't any street lights. They needed a full moon. They would meet on the night of the full moon, and they would discuss. One of their members was a man called Joseph Priestley. Joseph Priestley was not only a great chemist, anybody who learned chemistry in school will have heard of Priestley's name, but he was a political radical whose ideas had quite a lot to do with the American Revolution. So freedoms mattered. Without those freedoms, there would have been no steam revolution. And we need to remember that. So the whirl of the steam colours, faster and faster, gives you the white heat of human hope progress, the steam of steams. So I'll finish off by noticing that when we started, we had Matisse uh, lady dancers. There are five of them, but they don't actually join up. There's a gap between the two ladies in the bottom left there. One is reaching for the other. I'd like to think that Matisse understood what I think I've understood, that you actually need six. So I put the sixth in, and there she is. So we've got steeds. Never stop your mind whirling and dancing. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's not Google's Translate. It's, it's a, a Google program called Ngram. Big N, G-R-A-M, all one word. And there's this huge database of printed work. And the Ngram goes off and it chases through the printed work in order to, to look for words and word clusters. So you could put in uh, freedom of expression, for example, and find out when that was first appeared in print and how often it's appeared in print and whether it's started stopping appearing, appearing in print. And they, it's not just English printed words, it's everybody's that they can get hold of. Obviously there are limits, their sample isn't every book. And the real problem with Chinese of course is that almost all early Chinese is traditional characters. And a lot of it is not optical character recognition easy. If you played with Google Translate, uh, showing it grass script, for example, it can never translate it. It can translate printed script, but anything that's written, any woodblock stuff, it simply goes, can't do it. Um, so the, the text sample 
from which Google was working was limited. It required people to have input uh, Chinese classics, for example, in uh, machine-readable form. And at the same time, they only have a simplified character sampler. And they've obviously been, they've faced complaints, I think, from Chinese scholars about the way in which this doesn't consistently look for the traditional character the simplified character uh, represents. And so it wasn't finding a true sample. It was finding what seemed to me an indicative sample, but to purists it wasn't finding a good enough sample. So Google just said, right, in that case we won't look at anything that isn't in simplified characters, which effectively means that it's only 20th century stuff. Um, and that's, that's the problem. For sampling in Chinese, it's, it's just no longer helpful. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Mm. But it's great fun to play with. Uh, Google Ngram is one of life's great joys. Okay, if you look at a screw, a screw thread is what's called a helix. And a propeller is actually elements of that helix. You, if it's a three-bladed propeller, it's three helices that wind like that. So when we talk about a screw propeller, we're, we're telling you that it's doing two things. It, telling you two things about it. Screw says how it works. It's a helix that twists along, like a wood screw. If you screw a screw, it goes into the wood. If you screw it this way, it comes out of the wood. So a screw is something that when you work it, moves into or along something, or, as with Archimedes screw, it can screw water from here to here. So then you just create a port, what's called a portmanteau word and say this is something that propels. If I throw something, I'm propelling it. Something that propels by using a screw. So if we were being absolutely proper, as the chief petty officers were who trained me in the Royal Navy, we would only ever refer to a screw propeller. We would never just talk about a propeller and we would never abbreviate it to screw. But of course, that's exactly what we do. We refer to a screw and we refer to a propeller. Uh, when I was a Royal Marine, uh, our senior non-commissioned officers were called quartermaster sergeants and we would refer to them as Q. And, they would, and I remember quartermaster sergeant Lusby said, young sir, quartermaster sergeant, I am not something at a bus stop. My chief petty officer has had the same view about screw and screw propeller. It's a screw propeller, sir. That's what you must remember. Okay, I, I think the answer is nobody knows. It's the most recent stuff. There's a, there's a man called Joel Mokia who writes extremely good histories of, of ideas based in some, some, somewhere in the States. I forget where it was. Uh, Indiana, I think. And he's written a wonderful book called The Gifts of Athena. She's the goddess of wisdom. And he's trying to 
trying to get at, as many historians over the last 50 years have tried to get at, what is it that triggers it? Let's look at the negative to the positive for a moment. One of the greatest exercises in scholarship of the last 50 years has been the late Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization in China, which is 26 volumes and I think altogether about 60 big fat books and it's still not complete. And this massive exercise has been driven by Needham trying to answer what historians call the Needham question. If you look at China in, let's say, the Song Dynasty or in the High Qing in the mid-18th century, you, you can see lots of extraordinary ingenuity. China had gas being piped around to houses to cook on in the Song Dynasty. It was using uh, pipe bores to get salt brine up from salt deposits underground. It was mining coal. It was making high quality steel using a very primitive form of blast furnace. This is much of this is the Song Dynasty. So Needham is pointing out the amount of sheer technical ingenuity in China was extraordinary. And yet it didn't go anywhere. And nobody yet has managed to answer why in the Western world for some reason between the 16th and the 19th century it did go somewhere it looks like at the moment the the finger is pointing at the Atlantic Ocean I really like this because it's to do with the sea and the Atlantic Ocean and the discovery of America we call it discovery but of course the people who were there knew it was there uh, it was the Westerners' discovery of America, Western Europeans. They discover America, and America, for reasons, again, that nobody really understands, was more or less empty. The total population of the Americas at the Columban moment in 1492 was quite small, thought to be about 60 million people over that massive pair of continents. And once the Columban exchange of diseases had gone, 95%, 95% of those had died of measles, influenza, typhoid, all brought by R4444 bears. So the place is empty, more or less, and it is absolutely stuffed with materials. And many people think that this liberated Europe in a way that the old world had never previously been liberated from the tyranny of success. In all previous society, when you got successful, the little trigger went and we all thought, hey, life is good, let's have more babies. So we did. And with more babies, there were more mouths to feed, but we didn't have the technology which could come into use quickly enough to help us feed the extra mouths and the next thing, there would be a collapse. And then we'd start over from base again. Because our resource base was not big enough to help us feed a growing population, which, of course, growing population, it's hands that can work. With the Americas, with a new resource base, which was minimally exploited by the indigenous peoples, lucky them, but unlucky them that the Europeans discovered this, that stuff could come across the Atlantic and help relieve Europeans from the resource curse. China, by contrast, never managed to escape that. It would occasionally have great booms and then the population would spike and then there'd be a famine or a plague and it wouldn't recover. It would then take off again slowly and then crash off again. So that magic additional surplus freed people, perhaps, to start thinking. It enabled them to accumulate capital. And as a piece of blind good fortune, it created what we might call a virtuous feedback loop. And from then, there was no looking back. Blind good luck. <laughs>
I think that's the answer.